הסימפוזיון מתנהל באנגלית ואני אעבור לאנגלית. While uh, Leon Wieseltier is making his way uh, to joining us, may I, may I ask those who sit uh, in the upper rows to, to draw closer. Um, I must also say that uh, the relationship between the size of the auditorium and the size of the audience is not an analogy to the state of the Israeli budget, but uh, there was an an overestimate on our part, uh, but if those who sit up there will join us uh, further close, uh, closer to, uh, to the stage, to the podium, uh, I think we would all feel cozier. Uh, welcome to, uh, to this uh, symposium that uh, emanates from uh, uh, the prize in the present dimension uh, given in the realm of ideas, semicolon, public intellectuals and contemporary uh, philosophers. Uh, every year when the, when the board of the Dan David Foundation uh, thinks about the allocation of, uh, of the fields, uh, we try to think of a, of a field in, uh, in the present time dimension that has a major impact uh, on our lives. Uh, we've, uh, we've chosen uh, literature, environment, other issues, and uh, perhaps not in the, in the right order, we arrived at ideas that I think have, have a powerful influence on, on our lives as individuals and, and societies. And uh, I'd like to, to begin by, by quoting a, a beautiful paragraph uh, authored by uh, the late Albert Horani, a great historian of, uh, of the modern Middle East, a British-Lebanese uh, historian who began one of his essays uh, with the following paragraph. Delicate and complex as butterflies, our ideas may grow from their first beginnings in the secret womb of a single mind until they shake the foundations of society. Even when they die, they may leave behind them mental habits which mold our thinking more sometimes than we know. So it is very much in the same spirit that, that we chose the, the field of ideas. The, uh, uh, the panel of judges chose as recipients one philosopher and one public intellectual. The philosopher is Michel Serre, and the public intellectual is Leon Wieseltier. Uh, we've uh, uh, done this year what we do every year and ask uh, our laureates uh, to share some of their knowledge, insight, expertise, stature uh, with uh, uh, the public, uh, Tel Aviv University audience and the larger uh, Israeli audience. And we have also asked uh, Professor Shimon Shamir, my friend and colleague, to, to join us uh, to address specifically the role of ideas and intellectuals in uh, the contemporary uh, Arab world and even more specifically uh, the Arab Spring. Um, and so we'll have a well-rounded panel. And the way we'll proceed is uh, I will uh, present uh, an initial question to uh, each of our, our panelists. They will respond. They may comment on one another, and then we'll open up, and, and please feel free to, uh, to ask, comment, and generate a, a conversation uh, between the panel and the audience, because at the end of the day, what is intellectual life but a dialogue among among the many. So, uh, Professor Sir, let, let me begin with you. Obviously, you are French, and uh, when one thinks about ideas and public intellectuals, one thinks, I think, in the first place about France. I remember that uh, your most famous newspaper, Le Monde, has a page called IDE, which doesn't happen in too many other countries or too many other, too many other newspapers. And I'd like to ask you to, uh, to begin by talking to us about the French intellectual uh, tradition. Professor Serre will speak in French. We have a, a translator who will translate into English. Please. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Rabinovitch. Uh, ma réponse sera en trois parties. Je vais d'abord parler de l'histoire, ensuite de la définition de la question, et ensuite des problèmes d'aujourd'hui. Thank you very much. 
I would like to thank you very much, Professor Rabinovich. I will split my answer into three parts. The historical part, the definition, the definition, and the third part, who is the... Uh, today. The today. Today, yes. Today issues. Alors, pour l'histoire, cette question a une très grande antiquité, puisque déjà Platon était le conseiller d'un tyran de Sicile et qu'Aristote avait été le gouverneur ou l'instructeur d'Alexandre le Grand. I would like to first to talk about the antiquity. We can talk about uh, Platon and uh, about um, de, 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 the counselor of uh, uh, and the, counselor, he was the, the king of, of Sicily. Sicily. Yes. yes. And the Aristotle was the teacher. Of Alexander the Great, yes. Et pour, pour ce qui concerne la France, la question commence en gros euh, au moment des Lumières, de l'Enlightenment. As for France, the, the things are starting during the Enlightenment period. Mm -hmm. euh, avec Voltaire, Rousseau et d'autres philosophes. With Voltaire, Rousseau and other philosophers. Qui, qui ouvrent la voie de cette question. And this is the first part of the issue. Et au 19e siècle, les philosophes seront relayés par des écrivains comme Victor Hugo euh, qui euh, intervient sur la question de la peine de mort, de la death penalty. In the 9th century, they were succeeded mostly by writers such as Victor Hugo who intervened in the question of the death penalty. Et au 20e siècle, au moment de l'affaire Dreyfus, c'est Zola qui va intervenir avec des texte très célèbre, j'accuse, etc. And on, and on the 20th century, we can see Zola who came with text with very uh, uh, important texts such, such as j'accuse. Et au milieu du 20e siècle, l'homme le plus important sur cette question c'est Sartre qui euh, déclare une théorie de l'engagement, de l'engagement philosophique pour la politique et Sartre a été professeur, philosophe, écrivain, il a eu à peu près toutes les euh, qualifications et donc il résume très bien, aussi bien la personne que sa théorie, il résume très bien cette question. On the 20th century, we have the most important Sartre's theory of engagement and it's, it really, it's a summarize of this history. Sartre himself was a teacher, a writer, a philosopher and a journalist all at once. Et euh, en, en France au moins, la question commence au moment du déclin de la puissance de l'Église catholique, de la Roman Catholic Church, euh, qui euh, était plutôt favorable à l'établissement des pouvoirs temporels des rois, qui régnaient de droit divin. En France, at least, this tradition follows the decline of the Catholic Church, which represented the spiritual and sometimes even temporal power as opposed to the purely temporal power of the kings who reigned according to divine right. Voilà pour l'histoire. This is the history part. Euh, pour la définition maintenant, je dirais volontiers que la question que vous m'avez posée du rapport entre les intellectuels et le pouvoir politique, c'est une, euh, une sorte d'avatar d'une vieille question du partage entre le pouvoir temporel et le pouvoir spirituel. As for your question of the relations between the intellectuals and the political power, it could be considered as a contemporary avatar of the permanent relation between those two powers. Je crois qu'on peut dire qu'il n'existe pas dans l'histoire de pouvoir politique euh, qui ne soit pas scindé en deux entre le pouvoir spirituel et le pouvoir temporel. I believe that there has never been in history any power that doesn't split into two, the uh, spiritual one and the temporal one, and to, to arrive to a sort of equilibrium, the sort of balance. C'est cet équilibre qui est recherché et que Rousseau définit très bien dans une phrase célèbre du contrat social où il dit, je cite, « Personne n'est jamais assez fort pour être toujours le maître » S'il ne transforme la force en droit et l'obéissance en devoir. La force en droit et l'obéissance en devoir. C'est-à-dire 
le temporel et le spirituel. As for the temporal and the spiritual, Rousseau states this kind of situation, and he writes, no one is ever strong enough to remain the master forever if he does not transform his force into law, obedience and duty. Et bien entendu, la catastrophe arrive lorsque l'un des deux pouvoirs cumule les deux. Lorsque le pouvoir temporel prend le pouvoir spirituel ou le pouvoir spirituel prend le temporel. Auquel cas, c'est la tyrannie. And however, catastrophe occurs when one of the power holds both at the same time. Either the spiritual power takes on the power of arms or it has a demanding ideology. In either case, This leads to the worst tyranny because no counterforce can prevail. Et c'est toujours intéressant dans un pays donné de se poser la question qui détient le pouvoir spirituel. And it is always very interesting in any country to ask who is the one to possess this spiritual power. Qui en France le détient Qui aux États-Unis le détient qui en Israël le détient, qui en Chine le détient, et ainsi de suite. Who has this power either in France, in the US, in China, in Israel? Alors, maintenant, ce pouvoir spirituel, je crois pouvoir le diviser en deux parties. Une partie critique et une partie organique. I, I think I, I would split the spiritual power into two, the critical part and the organic part. Parce que euh, lorsque un intellectuel, comme on le dit ici, euh, et, euh, critique le pouvoir en place, il est obligé tous les jours de veiller de façon précise à tous les événements et à toutes les décisions que prend le pouvoir. When, generally, when an intellectual criticizes the situation, the real situation, he has to consider and take into account all the events and reality. Around this same power. Et par conséquent, là, il, il manque un peu de recul, de distance, pour se poser d'autres questions que les questions de lutte quotidienne contre le pouvoir ou de jugement sur le pouvoir. And sometimes he, he is too afar from other questions than those regarding uh, combats and struggles. C'est pourquoi. Il y a vraiment deux intellectuels possibles, celui qui euh, est le critique, le journalier, et puis celui qui a du recul et qui se pose la question, peut-on inventer une autre forme de gouvernement que celle que nous connaissons Finally, the critics are split into two. The, um, um, how do you say, the daily criticizer and the one who will ask much further and deeper question, how To consider the power. Et je prends comme exemple les théoriciens au XIXe siècle qu'on a appelés les socialistes utopiques. Les socialistes utopiques. And my example will refer to the uh, socialist utopic, the utopical socialist in the 19th century. century. Et ils n'ont jamais eu le pouvoir. Et chaque fois qu'ils ont approché du pouvoir, ça a été un échec. They have never had the power in their hands, and every time they try to, it was a failure. Et cependant, et cependant, but, et cependant, euh, ce qui tient chez nous de liberté ou d'art de vivre vient souvent de leur invention. But generally, uh, anything related to the art of living or freedom is uh, a source that comes from them. Les crèches pour enfants. Kindergarten, small kindergarten les, for children. Les, les banques pour les pauvres. Banks for poor people. La sécurité sociale. Social security. Les mutuelles de travail et de gestion. Federations for works, Tout, worker federations. Toutes ces inventions viennent des socialistes utopiques. And all these inventions are the source of the utopic socialist or socialist utopique. Et par conséquent, je ferai plutôt l'éloge de l'utopie c'est-à-dire de ceux qui prennent assez de recul pour inventer de nouvelles formes. And I think it's, I, I, I give them, um, I, I am, for them, I think they did a wonderful thing. Et d'une certaine manière, Israël, c'est déjà une utopie réalisée. And pas? finally, Israel is, a, a, is an achieved <laughs> et, utopie. Et, et les États-Unis aussi. And the United States as well. Et dernière question maintenant. 
C'est l'état de la question today, aujourd'hui. We'll talk about today, the present. Je, je crois que l'arrivée de ce qu'on appelle les nouvelles technologies vont changer la question. It seems to me that the development of new technologies throw a new light on this question. Parce que dans les pays occidentaux, ce sont les médias qui aujourd'hui tiennent le pouvoir spirituel. Because we know that in western countries today, these are the media that hold the spiritual power. Et euh, ce pouvoir spirituel peut être défini simplement par une seule phrase concernant le nombre. And this uh, spiritual power by media can be defined by the simple uh, definition based on the number. Yes. C'est peu d'émetteurs pour beaucoup de récepteurs. Few transmitters for many receivers. Et dès qu'on a ce chiffre, on a une sorte de pyramide avec un sommet très étroit et une base très large. And the number... Et cela reproduit le pouvoir hiérarchique usuel. It represents the usual hierarchy, hierarchical power. Et il est donc aisé aux gens qui ont beaucoup d'argent de prendre la main sur le sommet, sur le, le, à appartenir le sommet. It is therefore easy for people with money to obtain this concentrated power by simply buying it. Alors, les nouvelles technologies ont un chiffre complètement différent. On the contrary, the new technologies represent a totally different number. Et dans les nouvelles technologies, il y a autant d'émetteurs que de récepteurs. In the new technologies, we have the same number of transmitters as receivers. Donc, ce compte-là, ce nouveau compte, détruit totalement la pyramide précédente. This new number or account erases or destroys the, the pyramid. Et étale cette pyramide dans un réseau qui, est, qui peut dessiner une nouvelle utopie. And it spreads it, it spreads the pyramid into a network that provides perhaps a new utopian situation. Et, et cette utopie peut dessiner une nouvelle forme de gouvernement démocratique. And this new utopia can draw a new form of democracy. Et toute la question que vous me posez aujourd'hui, professeur Rabinovitch, euh, tient, doit tenir compte de l'état actuel de ces nouvelles technologies et du coup se poser la question sur les intellectuels, qu'est-ce qu'ils peuvent faire dans ce réseau-là And about the question you are asking me, Professor Rabinovich, we have to see how those new technologies are going on in the utopias and what they can do. Ce qui peuvent, euh, quelle est leur existence, quelle est leur qualité d'expert, quel est leur rôle et quelle est leur influence their dans, existence, dans their ces nouvelles task, conditions. Their impact in a very new situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sir. I, I'm a I must say that uh, on a in a personal way, uh, splitting your time between Paris and Silicon Valley, yes. <laughs> you embody exactly. this new development. Yes. Uh, let me now turn to, to Leon Wieseltier and, and ask him to, to speak mainly about the United States, where I think we've had, uh, since the early days of, of the Republic, Two contradictory trends. I mean, the founding fathers were a, a unique group of individuals. If you read the Federalist Papers today, you must be impressed by the high level of, of the authors, the founding fathers. And I recall Hofstadter's uh, famous book, Anti-Intellectualism in, in, in America. And, and the two trends coexist, maybe unhappily, Uh, uh, in, in the United States, and I'd ask you to reflect on, on this tension uh, between the two trends and, and, and its impact on public life in, in the United States. Is this working? Yes. Um, that's a very large question. I think that you're right. The United States was founded by intellectuals, at least. Madison, Jefferson, some of the others were political philosophers of the first rank, of the first rank. Um, it's certainly true that like most traditions, we have not lived up to our founders in many ways. Um, and anti-intellectualism, as Hofstadter and others have shown, is a very powerful current 
in American life. It gets complicated in the United States in a variety of ways. In the first place, in the United States, we have in some ways pioneered in what might be called the anti-intellectualism of the intellectuals, uh, in that the, you know, the America's great contribution to world philosophy is the philosophy known as pragmatism, which is in some ways profoundly hostile to philosophy itself. Um, and even now, in, uh, the, 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 in, I regard the United States right now as one of the most unphilosophical or anti-philosophical places that have ever existed. Um, there has been a kind of a, a combination of forces between the tradition of philosophical pragmatism on the one hand based upon the, shall we say, the practicality of the American mentality that was noted as early as by, by Tocqueville and others. On the one hand that, on the other hand, the new predominance of the technological mentality that is derived from the new digital technology. Uh, the technology is having a, an enormous view upon the American worldview, though I hesitate to say the American worldview because I think the United States is now living in a time where, uh, except for traditionalists, and we can discuss their position in a moment, we are a society that doesn't really, we don't live with worldviews anymore. Um, you know, uh, the, the writer Robert Musil once wrote that in order to have a worldview, you have to have a view of the world. And um, Americans don't have worldviews anymore. Um, in America right now, the most important question that you could ask about anything is not is it true or false, or is it good or evil, or is it beautiful or ugly. The most important question you can ask about anything now is how does it work? How does it work? Um, which is a particular sort of question. It's not an especially philosophical question. It's not a normative question. And there is almost a kind of anti-intellectual bias in the question itself. And if you want to be known as exceptionally smart, as soon as somebody explains to you how something works, you say, no, 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 this is how it really works. And then you're a genius in America. Um, this is not good. This is not good. Um, with the exception of certain traditional communities, I find American public life right now, uh, well, let me put it, let me, let me complicate it a little bit. American public life right now is characterized by a paradoxical a confluence of intensely held ideologies on the one hand and the absence of any real devotion to first principles on the other. It's a very strange moment. Um, it's a very strange moment. American politics is extremely ideological, uh, pointlessly ideological in some ways, um, so that the radicals generally set the tone for the debate um, and in this context, of course, so-called pragmatists can come as a relief. But it is also a time in which Americans are not especially interested about in, in the larger questions of life. Uh, they're just not, you see this in philosophy. Some of this has to do with the new tyranny of scientism, of the Darwinists, of genetic explanations of human behavior. There are all sorts of, there are all sorts of determinisms and holistic explanations of life that have retired a certain degree of interest in the larger questions, um, or rather have answered the larger questions in a very simplistic way, in a very simplistic way. Now, we're speaking mainly here, I think, about political ideas, uh, which are in some ways, they, they, they have a different metabolism, a different character than ideas about the cosmos or ideas about the, the, the good, the true, and the beautiful. Um, America right now, you know, there is, again, we're, there's a paradoxical situation. On the one hand, we are all instructed to believe that intellectuals, as they say, should tell truth to power, should tell truth to power, which means that there should be an essentially adversarial relationship between intellectuals and the government and the powers, um, essentially adversarial. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, American policy is driven, deeply driven, by the ideas of intellectuals, policy ideas, not necessarily theories of world history, but policy ideas. 
my own view is that it is impossible to make a rule about what the relationship should be between intellectuals and power in the following sense. Intellectuals should all, I should say, the, the government is never always right and never always wrong. That's my, my first assumption. So that it is not a betrayal of the intellectual vocation, it is not a treason, if you will, on the part of an intellectual to offer support for a policy that the government is pursuing, as long as the intellectual derives his reasons for that support, not from the government or the policy itself, but from arguments of his or her own that are advanced with a deep concern for the integrity of that argument. In other words, I think that in that sense, the intellectual, the intellectual must be independent in the sense that his, his argument derives not from interests, but from ideas or from reasons. Right? But, but, but uh, yes, so that, that's the first point I would make. Um, there are, there are um, in the history of the relationship between intellectuals and power in the United States and elsewhere has been a very modeled history. There are intellectuals who have actually assumed power. In America, since the founding fathers, um, we've had, you know, Abraham Lincoln was in some sense an intellectual Woodrow Wilson was certainly an intellectual. Um, Barack Obama thinks he's an intellectual. Um, but generally, we have not had intellectuals rule us, and which is probably a good thing in the sense that the experiment of intellectuals actually taking power has often not ended well. I mean, for me, the greatest example of the intellectual actual taking power, of course, is Lenin. Is Lenin, who was a genuine intellectual, a brilliant intellectual, and actually acted upon his own program. The problem, the complication with political ideas as opposed to metaphysical ideas or literary or cultural ideas is that when one holds a political idea, one actually wishes that it will be realized. It is not a purely theoretical exercise. And in that sense, intellectuals become responsible for and complicit with governments insofar as they adopt, as they adopt the ideas um, that are proposed. Um, the most recent example of this in American history, I guess, would be the Reagan presidency, which was really, really driven by a, a wide array of conservative ideas that were brought to the government in a very unmediated way and acted upon and acted upon. Um, the problem, the deeper problem is in America is trying to figure out what an intellectual is, which is a question we have to ask ourselves. There was a very brilliant critic many years ago in the 60s who once said that an intellectual is anybody who carries a briefcase to work. Um, this of course is incorrect as a definition. I guess the equivalent contemporary definition would be anybody who owns a laptop. Um, but we know that that is incorrect. We know that that is incorrect. In fact, one of the things that we're just beginning to deal with now that the first era of giddiness and dizziness about the digital technology is ending, we're coming to grips with some of the most profoundly anti-intellectual implications of the new technology. Um, the new technology is not, um, it is the greatest assault on human attention ever devised. In some ways, it is the greatest assault on human reason ever devised, insofar as it facilitates the creation of a whole new kind of demagoguery and a whole new kind of mob, of a whole new kind of mob. Um, and there is, of course, nothing I mean, there's nothing more antithetical to intellectual life than the mob, than the mob. Now, America is a very optimistic country, so in my country right now, you hear a great deal about the wisdom of crowds. It's about the wisdom of crowds. Everybody is excited about this thing called crowdsourcing, which the technology permits, so that everything can now be, crowds can be made to form digitally and so on. Those of us who were raised either um, on the study of, or who, I'm too young, but who know about the experience of crowds in 20th century history, find it a little bit harder to be enthusiastic about the creation of new crowds. Uh, and in some way it might be said that the role of the intellectual in America right now is not so much to stand against the government, but to stand against the crowd, to stand against the mob. Um, and by this, by the mob, I mean mainly the mob of the media and the digital mob, uh, and the digital mob. 
Um, you know, I've always thought that without romanticizing the intellectual, I think that loneliness or isolation is a hallmark of intellectual life. I don't mean to be romantic about that because we all have friends and lovers and so on. But still, there has to be some sense of, of, of critical distance, of detachment that one holds, that one holds. Um, in America right now, it must be said that A, intellectual life has been fragmented between journalism and the academy so that, you know, there are many journalists and there are many professors. I'm not sure how many intellectuals there are right now operating in the field, as it were. Um, and B, the application, the philosophical criticism of politics, which I think is one of the duties of the political app, of intellectual, has, is becoming increasingly rare. There's an enormous amount of political criticism, but these, the criticisms that are made are generally not made in terms of first philosophical principles in the way that they were made by the founders, by the founders um, of the state. There's a lot more to be said, but I'll stop there. Thank you. So we've, uh, we've spoken about France, Europe, the, the old world. We spoke about the new world. I'd like to move uh, closer uh, to us, to, to the Middle East. My, my colleague, uh, Professor Shamir, has worked for many years on uh, the role of intellectuals in, in Arab politics, an issue that uh, came to the fore in, in, during the past uh, two years or so when, when people moved by ideas uh, toppled governments in, in the Middle East. And, of course, uh, the role of ideas and intellectuals in these events uh, has been studied and spoken about often, but it is not something that uh, happened in the last few years. It has deeper roots. And it's about these deeper roots, uh, Shimon, that I'd like to ask you to speak. Thank you, Itamar. Um, you mentioned the Arab Spring, the, the Arab Spring, the development of the last two and a half years in Egypt and other countries. Um, this is just the last stage in a century-old. Um, story of um, love-hate relationship between intellectuals and power uh, in Egypt. Um, it started, I would say, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Professor Scher started with Rousseau and uh, Leon Wieseltier started with Jefferson, so I should um, believe start with Tahoussen and, uh, and his colleagues. The first half of the 20th century was the first period of effective large-scale modernization, a fundamental change in the life of the Egyptians, and naturally changes of this kind need intellectuals. Uh, modernization needed conceptualization, legitimation. It was an attack on the norms and values and institutions of the traditional society. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the politicians needed guidance, the public needed education, and Egypt was quite uh, fortunate to have at that time a group of uh, remarkably creative intellectuals, gifted intellectuals, thinkers, writers, artists, who could provide that. They, they preached uh, modernity, they spoke about civil law, about constitutionalism, about nationalism, they articulated a new positive attitude to Western civilization, uh, and very cautiously they started moving toward separation of uh, religion and state. Um, this made them quite influential. This is the heyday, really, of intellectuals in Egyptian history, modern history. They um, were prestigious. Two of them were even appointed as cabinet ministers. There was a symbiosis here between intellectuals and power. Uh, the only problem is it did not last more than the period as I defined it. And in 1952, we have the Nazarites Revolution. Now, many people see that revolution as a watershed. Watershed. Everything changed from the ancien regime to the new regime. Uh, and therefore, uh, presumably, there was a period in which intellectuals should have come to the fore. Uh, in the perspective of today, I think it is seen differently. Um, there was more continuity in the Nazareth revolution 
than change. You see, the paradigm of, of modernization was already there. What the revolutionaries had to do is to uh, discard some of the options offered by uh, this Western uh, paradigm and, uh, and, uh, and opt for others, but all within the same framework. Uh, Nasserism opted for uh, guided democracy, the one-party system, uh, for which there are a number of models in Europe. They opted for socialism. They called it Arab socialism. It was actually a social economic system based on the Yugoslav system in Europe. Uh, they changed the liberal nationalism to radical nationalism of pan-Arabism, also a, a, a trend uh, that is familiar from Western experience. So um, they did not feel that they really need the intellectuals. All the more so since those were intellectuals were liberals and uh, did not like the authoritarian type of regime that emerged there. Um, the intellectuals were marginalized. Um, some of them left the country. And some of them were co-opted. And the most prominent among them were put in golden cages. They were given special offices in the Haram building where they could do whatever they wished on one condition that they don't publish anything that embarrasses the regime. Uh, to tell the truth, this uh, um, déclassé status uh, of the intellectuals was to a large extent also their doing. Uh, they were completely uh, swept by the lure of Nasserism. They looked at Nasserism, it appeared to them such a successful movement, so popular, it establishes the place of Egypt in uh, uh, the international arena, and they felt that perhaps their own road was not the right road to take. Uh, and uh, they accepted this status of uh, inactive uh, intellectuals. Uh, but here this stage also ended. Um, the chain of successes uh, reached its end. In the mid-60s it was quite clear that uh, many of the projects of the revolution reached an, 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 a dead end. And then came, of course, 1967, which completely smashed the aura of success and brilliance uh, of Nasser. Uh, and uh, since in Egypt many people regard as a legitimizing factor of power uh, effective performance, many of them said Nasser lost his legitimacy. So the time for reckoning came, and the intellectuals started re-examining uh, the record of Nasserism and their own record in it. The most uh, famous document that emerged at that time uh, by Taufik al-Hakim, one of the leading and most respected intellectuals in Egypt, was called The Return of Consciousness, Audat al uh, It was translated to many languages. Um, in which uh, Tawfiq al-Hakim re-examines the record of Nasser and exposes dictatorships, corruption, and all the wrongdoings of this regime. And then he comes to the point, the treason of intellectuals. He asks himself, where were we? We should have understood all that. We didn't, uh, we didn't protest in any way. Um, and uh, in a way that... It reminded me of The God That Failed. You, you remember that book by André Gide and uh, Kessler and others who were disillusioned with communism and published this, this disillusionment. This is what Taufik al-Hakim did. So a new generation of liberals, of intellectuals emerged uh, who preached similar things as the first generation. They spoke also about openness to the world, about rationalism, more courageously they spoke about separation of religion and state. Um, and uh, in a way, uh, they were ready to find a place for themselves in the systems of Sadat and Mubarak. Um, there was actually some common ground between uh, these two entities. Um, 
there was some agreement about some basic premises. Uh, Mubarak needed banks that take interest, uh, unlike what the Islamists preached. Uh, uh, we needed a, a general climate in Egypt which would be conducive to investments from the outside world. He needed security forces that could fight the Islamists, the Islamist terrorism, and believe in what they were doing. And the intellectuals could provide that. Saeed Ashmawi, the uh, judge, former brilliant intellectual, actually went to lecture in the police academies. And Saladin Ibrahim, one of the leading intellectuals of that stage, found channels to this presidential palace through his wife, through the wife of Mubarak, who was a student at the American University of Cairo. And he started a dialogue with Mubarak. But Mubarak wouldn't take it. He decided that he did not want to confront the Islamists conceptually head on. Instead, he opted for some duplicity. He was doing some, one thing and saying something different. He um, paid lip service to Islamism and kept a distance between him and the intellectuals. So uh, this attempt failed, and the intellectuals focused from now on on what interested them most, which is the, the kind of regime that exists in Egypt. Um, the first decade of this century, uh, the decade before the Arab Spring, was a period of bitter struggle between them and, and, and the government. And the government reacted. Saladin Ibrahim was imprisoned twice, uh, and at the end he had to leave Egypt and lived in exile. Uh, other intellectuals were persecuted. Uh, they did not uh, keep silent, but since the state in Egypt controls so many resources, only those who had the freedom to express themselves, uh, those who had um, funds from the outside, or who had uh, uh, their own funds, like uh, Tarek Hegi was a high official in an oil company. They could express uh, their views, um, sometimes cautiously, sometimes more bravely. And perhaps one, then, one intellectual that I should uh, mention is Ala El Aswani, whose novel, uh, The House of Jacobian, was a devastating critic of the corruption and the practices of the Mubarak regime. This novel became so popular, not only in Egypt, in the Arab world, that the authorities did not dare to touch him. And then came the Arab Spring, and the intellectuals were euphoric. Those young people in Tahrir Square were their disciples. They were speaking the same language. Saad and Ibrahim came back from his exile directly to Tahrir Square. Ala El Aswani uh, sat with those young demonstrators day and night, lecturing to them, explaining to them what they were doing. Uh, at one point, he debated, it was a public debate between him and Ahmad Shafiq, the uh, prime minister chosen by Mubarak. And his arguments were so telling that the next day, Ahmad Shafiq resigned. So these were days of hope, but they did not last again. But again, they didn't last. Um, as we all know, the revolution in Egypt was hijacked, first by the military and then by the Islamists. Uh, the intellectuals were disillusioned. Some of them again left the country. Tarek Higi now lives in London. Um, and they found themselves in a situation where the gap between them and power is wider than ever. As wide as the gap with uh, Nasser and Mubarak were, the gap between them and the Islamists of Morsi is much, much wider. So in a nutshell, this is a story, and it doesn't have a happy end. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll do another round with uh, our three panelists, and then, then we'll open up. Uh, Professor Sell, uh, I'd like to refer the, uh, the, next, uh, the following question to you. We, in the subtitle uh, uh, of, of this symposium, we put 
and the treason of the intellectuals and the opium of the intellectuals revisited. These, these are two of the best known books on intellectuals, intellectuals and power. They both were written by, by Frenchmen, one in the 1920s and one in the 1950s. So from the perspective of 2013, are you willing to take a look at these two books? Je, je crois qu'aujourd'hui, euh, d'ailleurs, le euh, professeur Wieselder l'a dit aussi, aussi bien aux États-Unis qu'en France, nous vivons un déchirement presque aussi important que celui qui a été décrit pour l'Égypte. I think that today, and Mr. Wieselder talked about it, in the United States as well as in France, we are living a very, very deep. Uh, Tearing situation is split. D'une part, vous l'avez dit très bien, il y a un déferlement des idéologies les plus conservatives. And on one part, as you told it, there is a flood, a big flood of conservative ideologies. Et d'autre part, l'obligation pour nous, intellectuels, de comprendre ce qui se passe aujourd'hui dans ce que vous avez appelé la nouvelle carte ou la nouvelle foule. And on the other hand, there is an obligation for us intellectual to understand what's going on, on as a new map and a new mob. Parce que il est vrai que nous habitons dans un nouvel espace. Because it is true we are living in a new space. Euh, avec les nouvelles technologies nous pouvons avoir accès immédiatement à toutes les informations. New technologies can give us access to à, any information. À tous les lieux. To any place. Et à toutes les personnes. And to any person. Et du coup, ça définit une nouvelle communauté. It means it's a new definition of a new community. Et cette nouvelle communauté, nous n'avons pas encore de concept pour la comprendre. And still, for this new community, we don't have any concept to understand it. Et toute la question de l'intellectuel aujourd'hui, c'est d'inventer, c'est d'inventer de nouveaux, de nouvelles idées pour comprendre cette situation. And the, the, uh, the challenge of the intellectuals today is to try and understand and invent new definitions in order to understand this new community. D'où le déchirement complet entre les anciennes idéologies. And this is the source of the split between the old. Uh, ideologies, où les idées sont toutes faites with the very, uh, formatted et, ideas, et donc très efficaces very efficient ideas, et l'impossibilité où nous sommes d'avoir encore inventé quelque chose de nouveau. And still we are in the impossibility to invent something new. Et je pense que nous vivons aujourd'hui un, une période très passionnante et intéressante a very interesting and passionating parce era. que nous devons inventer précisément de nouvelles idées pour comprendre ces nouvelles situations. C'est pour ça que, euh, à, à part ce déchirement, je suis très très intéressé par la construction précisément de nouvelles philosophies. Um, Leon, I, I'd like to ask you to, to speak about one of the most curious and intriguing uh, issues of intellectuals in, in politics in America, the, the group known as the neocons. Oh. Uh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sure let me phrase the question. It may, may make it at least... Uh, at <laughs> somewhat less objectionable to you, uh, because we have a group of, of intellectuals, some of whom began on the left and then moved to, moved to, the, moved to the right, became what known as Reagan Democrats. Um, and I think the, the height of the debate with them and over them uh, had to do with the Iraq war. Because the, there is the argument that uh, it, it was the neocons who pushed the uh, Bush administration to the, to the Iraq war in the name of an idea, to export democracy to, uh, to the Middle East. Well, it may or may not have been 
uh, may not have been true, and we know the end of that, uh, uh, that episode, but it also opens up to, to a much larger issue of a group of intellectuals with a certain ideology, a shifting ideology, and a, a very complex relationship between them and a political group. Yeah, I think we can discuss them as an example of something. The neocon moment has passed. In fact, the most important development on the right in America recently has been the complete fragmentation of the consent, the intellectual consensus in the Republican Party. There no longer is a consensus on foreign policy. There is, to a certain extent, on domestic policy. Um, I think that uh, insofar, taking the neocons as an example, the war in Iraq, insofar as they were sincerely pursuing, attempting to apply their idea to policy, they weren't doing anything wrong. They may have had the wrong idea, but as I said, a, a, a political idea is not a, is not a poem. And if, if one has an idea about changing a certain political reality and one is sincere about the idea, then one must actually, um, that one, not can, one cannot be accused of betraying the intellectual vocation by actually acting on the idea. Um, the question, of, you know, what, what happens, what usually happens in such situations is that the intellectual quality of the idea matters much more than the interests that come behind it. You know, conservatives have, there was a book written in 1948 by a conservative, I guess you can call him a philosopher, called Richard Weaver, and the book is called Ideas Have Consequences. Conservatives like to say that ideas have consequences. What usually happens with people who say that ideas have consequences is that they care much more about the consequences than they do about the ideas. Um, I think that the larger question of the application of ideas to politics should be thought more constructively, perhaps, by thinking about the problem of idealism and realism among political intellectuals. It's a very, very difficult problem. Um, Every idealist has a special responsibility to be realistic in the sense to, to have a very close empirical understanding of reality. Otherwise, idealism becomes very dangerous. Realists have the mirror image responsibility to still maintain some standpoint for critique. Otherwise, they become complicitous with reality. For political intellectuals who attempt to have measures of both idealism and realism, it's very, hard to, it's, it's very hard to find the solution to this problem. Um, one wants to be, in politics, one must be realistic, but one must not be complicitous with reality, uh, because I mean, one should not be an accomplice, and realism should not make one an accomplice. In po political intellectuals must be idealists in some way, because they, they measure, they subject their society, they measure their society by a philosophical or moral standard that is in some sense very high, but there is always the danger of measuring society by the standards of purity, um, by standards of purity, which is very, very dangerous, um, very, very dangerous. Um, some of what we see, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the, the political intellectuals of the Islamists in the Arab world, and of course, just as Tahrir Square had its intellectuals, the Muslim Brotherhood has their intellectuals of whatever quality, is the, 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 the promotion of some sort of purity as an ideal for society to follow leads to a great deal of cruelty, always, a great deal of cruelty. So for political intellectuals in the States too, the question is how, how can one be a realist without being an accomplice of reality, and how can one be an idealist without being dangerously detached in a way that could lead actually to cruelty, um, to cruelty. Uh, questions of, you know, m my own view is that the, the debate about Iraq was never as simple as the critics of the war said it was. I should say I supported the war in Iraq when I believed that Saddam Hussein had, nu had weapons of mass destruction, when it became, and the reason was quite simple, which was that he had already used weapons of mass destruction in Halabja. It was not a theoretical question. No exercises in game theory were necessary in this matter. As soon as it became clear to me that he did not have weapons of mass destruction, I publicly recanted my support. However, I did say that the origins of a war have nothing, no bearing upon its outcome. So whereas I do believe that the war in Iraq was begun in a scandalous manner, 
I think the President of the United States took the country into a major war based on a mistake. I don't believe it was a lie. I think it was a mistake. The fact is I had hopes until the way we withdrew from Iraq that something good may come out of this war, may come out of this war. Um, but, ha but, having, but having said that, the, the intellectual moral situation about the debate of, about the war of Iraq is very complicated. When you engage in a debate about tyranny or in a debate about war and peace, your own position is never free from consequences. For example, those people who were against the war in Iraq, as far as I were concerned, were satisfied with the perpetuation in power of one of the cruelest dictators in the Middle East. A man who had been responsible, who, together with Iran, for the deaths of a million people in a pointless war, who had used chemical weapons against innocent civilians, and so on. I mean, none of us, you know, none of us is ever without implications of our views. I mean, in the debate in, in the American Jewish community over the decades about the settlements, about Palestine, and so on. I mean, when I be, I'm an old Shalom Achshav man, unrepentant, and they would always tell me, well, you don't live there to see the consequences of what happens. And I would say to them, actually, that's true, I would say to my right-wing Jewish friends, but you don't live there either to see the consequences of the continuation of the occupation and the terrorism that it provokes and so forth. In other words, there is no political position that does not have a consequence that one must not be held responsible for. And in the war in Iraq in America, the debate in that war was usually conducted, on the one side was the right wing, which was for the war, um, some of them defensively, some of them indefensively, and the left, which, um, which, in, which acted as if its own position on Iraq left it in a morally pure position. Um, which, of course, is never the case. The problem, in political intellectual life, purity is never an option. It's never an option. Uh, th there's one uh, problem now with the argument made to a right-wing uh, Jewish supporter of the settlements. When you say you don't live there, he says, I don't, but my son does. That uh, happens all too often. Uh, Shimon, I'd, I'd like to, to ask you in, in a more personal vein. Uh, you are an academic an intellectual as well. You've also, you're not in politics, but you, you were in policy twice, ambassador in Egypt, ambassador in Jordan. You wrote a book about your experience in, uh, in Jordan, and uh, you don't make explicit comments in that regard, but, but uh, when one reads the book, one can see that you are operating on two levels. You, you implemented a policy, but at the same time, you were the academic expert, the intellectual, who was also observing uh, the process, observing the, a government and a policy at work. Can you share with us uh, uh, some of your thoughts and experiences uh, uh, from that period? I shall be happy. I shall be happy to do this, but first allow me to uh, make some very brief uh, comments on uh, the two subjects that have been discussed uh, before me. Uh, you, you asked uh, Professor Sarah about, about uh, the treason of intellectuals, uh, the work of, uh, of Benda. Now, of course, we all know that uh, he spoke of, of a very particular kind of treason. He speaks in the 20s about what he called um, the intellectuals who indulge in collective political passions, in ideologies. Uh, and that was a period of ideology in Europe. Uh, ideologies were uh, uh, dominant. Um, in a way, this may be seen as perhaps as an obsolete work, but in one way, it is uh, um, a work that. Uh, that uh, tells us about things to come. Uh, ideology at that time was prominent, was uh, paramount. Um, then came Daniel Bell, the end of ideology. And I think, unlike that period, there is now a general uh, awareness that ideologies 
which are supposed to explain reality are actually distorting reality. There is no much trust in ideologies anymore. I think this is a big difference um, between the two periods. As for um, American idealists and Islamist uh, intellectuals, um, yes, uh, the Islamist movements have their intellectuals. Uh, they, produced a, they produce a huge volume of publications, journals, books, uh, whatever. Um, and what transpires from uh, reading uh, in that literature is that there is a basic difference between uh, those idealists you were talking about and the uh, intellectuals in the Islamist movement. Um, the idealists, uh, in, to different degrees, have all some vision. They have some hopes for a future which will be better, utopian or not utopian. The intellectuals of Islamism are exactly the opposite. They are past-oriented. They don't believe in the historical process. The historical process is sometimes a, a process of deterioration that must be fixed. Uh, and here is a big gap between the two, in, in, in my opinion. Now, uh, about my book, uh, yes, I, I served as uh, ambassador in Egypt and first ambassador in Jordan. And um, um, I felt the need first to inform and then to criticize. These are the two aspects I think you were referring to. Um, I felt that the Israeli public is not sufficiently uh, knowledgeable about the way Israeli dis diplomacy is conducted, about the experience of an attempt to establish a warm peace between us and the Jordanians. There was such an opportunity. And as a critic, I try to analyze the institutions so that deal with international uh, relations in this country and see what are their points of strength and where are the weaknesses. Uh, just uh, on my way here, I um, met one person who is in the audience, and he said, your book should be read by every official in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel. Yes, it would be nice. I don't believe this will happen. Yeah. Since they are on strike, uh, they, they have time. <laughs> uh, to our visitors, I should say that uh, we have a Ministry of Foreign Affairs without a minister on strike, and there is a so-called Ministry of Strategic Affairs that acts as a poor man's foreign ministry. So it's not a great time for, for Israeli diplomacy. We, uh, have, we have a foreign ministry that works, and it's not a great time for American diplomacy, so okay. don't feel bad. Thank you. Uh, okay, we are opening up. I see Hanna, uh, Professor Hannah Wirt Nesher. Uh, let me give you a, a microphone. Yes, thank you very much for raising such interesting um, d perspectives on these issues. Uh, I would like to, um, to ask you about going perhaps beyond the limits of the nation uh, when discussing uh, intellectuals. Um, in an age in which there's so much talk about cosmopolitanism. And so when, for example, someone like Kwame Anthony Appiah moves from Harvard to Princeton, it's on the first page of the New York Times. Uh, or if you look at the list of people um, recently in the last 10 years inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, so many of them recently come to the US. So my question is this. If what is the role of the cosmopolitan intellectual vis-a-vis -vis power globally or locally? And the specific case that I want to ask about concerns all three of you. Uh, and that is someone like Edward Said. That is someone who, whether you would consider him a public intellectual, took ideas from France, Foucault, Derrida, midwifed them into, the, into American academia, then came up with these concepts, Orientalism and so on, that cast a huge shadow within academia with its tremendous amount of power. And so my question is, is this some sort of ineffectual power, uh, a kind of gl glorified intellectual tourism? Or is cosmopolitan intellectualism a new arena for talking about power in intellectuals? 
Sorry? Well, yeah. should I go? go? Ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I, again, cosmopolitanism is a, very, is a very fashionable thing right now. It can mean many things. Um, Edward was, uh, in, one, in one sense, Edward was a cosmopolitan, but his cosmopolitanism was rooted in a fanatical devotion to the Palestinian people. I think that, um, and I'm not speaking here about the quality of his ideas, I think I would make one introductory point, which is that the distinction between the universal and the particular is a very overrated and not terribly interesting distinction. I think that there is no such thing as the pure universal and there is no such thing as the pure particular anywhere. If the pure universal or the pure particular existed, they would be perfect monsters. But there are no such people. And one can find the universal only in the particular and one studies the particular in the hope of being elevated to the universal. Um, so this whole distinction, you see this in literature, the greatest writers in literature I mean, you can think of Faulkner, Sholem Aleichem, Hardy, many of them. They write about little tiny corners of the world. And in this a Proust, and in this corner of the world, they find the whole universe. They find the whole universe. So in some way, this whole, the, the, you know, the, the distinction I don't find terribly helpful. Um, cosmopolitanism can also mean um, a belief in the either, in a denial of the legitimacy or a hope for the weakening of the nation state. Um, that's not a view that I share. That's not a view that I share. Um, I think the nation state is not going anywhere and has et cetera, et cetera. Um, it can also refer to the question of globalization. And here too, I think that globalization has become one of the cliches of our time. Uh, I think that, you know, the, gl the globalization insofar as it refers to CNN and the Internet, so that we have the universal access to information, that's true, but it's not terribly interesting at some level, at the level of philosophy or at the level of identity, at the le level of identity. Um, I think that um, insofar as the cosmopolitan individual, however, is an individual who has incorporated into his or her own identity influences that were not just the influences that he inherited, Sometimes one is a cosmopolitan simply by being influenced by what is across the street from where one lives. You don't have to be influenced by what's on the other side of the world. It has to do on one's openness to the other and on the extent to which one is willing to diversify one's identity with influences that, one, that are not one's own. That's cosmopolitanism. And in that sense, you can say that um, this brings us to the question of, and I guess back to Edward in some way, of multiculturalism. I've always thought that the ideal of the multicultural society is in many ways a wonderful ideal. The ideal that's always inspired me is the idea of the multicultural individual. Um, there are many, the problem with multicultural societies is that they tend not to produce multicultural individuals because they tend to encourage the individual to live within his or her specific bubble. So multicultural societies can often produce the opposite of cosmopolitanism, the opposite of cosmopolitanism, and produce individuals who are provincial in a very proud way, whose who's the primary value of their identity being authenticity. Authenticity, as you know, is a very complicated and complex value, very dubious in some way. So I think that, that um, you know, the, the idea of cosmopolitanism, a lot of intellectual pressure has to be applied has to, has to be applied to that. Um, we are all citizens of where we live and we are all citizens of the world. And what you measure individuals, if there were a metric, as the economists say, if there were a way to scientifically measure horizons, individually horizons, we might know a lot more about individuals than we do now. But if there were such a metric, it would have to do with these sorts of I cannot see very well because of, of the light, but uh, is there a hand somewhere? Okay. Or two. So, uh, the microphone will come to you. I'm interested in hearing your comments on the situation in Israel. Is there such a thing as intellectualism in Israel? Uh, who are the intellectuals? or the intellectual ideas that drive the powers today? 
Of course there are intellectuals in Israel. Um, I, I, yes, uh, I think that, I mean, that's a complicated question. I guess the interesting question is to what extent is um, the, the distinction between intellectual life and ideological life. We spoke earlier about ideologies and about the repudiation of ideologies. In political intellectual life, ideas tend to be translated into ideologies. And by ideologies, I mean a totalistic explanation, a totalistic explanation. Now, I should say that I don't, I mean, I, the critique of ideology that took place in the 1950s and afterwards mainly as a response to communist and left-wing ideology, though also to a certain extent to fascistic ideology. The, the, role, the, the place of that critique, the reason for it seems clear, but I do have to confess that in our famously post-ideological age, sometimes I miss ideology for the following reason. I miss it because I no longer know what many people believe. I no longer know what many people believe, and I have a suspicion that many people now believe that they can get by in life, in political life and in personal life, without large beliefs. That's just my suspicion. And ideology was a degraded form of political philosophy, but it was a form of political philosophy. That is to say, it did, it did, it did impose an intellectual responsibility on the citizen, on the individual, who had to believe something. Now, it could have been believed mechanically as catechism, the way many socialist and ideologies were, and the ideology could have been false, it frequently was false. But I have to say that there are worse things in life than being wrong. There are worse things than being wrong. Not having any view whatsoever strikes me as a much graver mistake than having a mistaken view. And I guess if you want to speak about, you asked about Israel, and my, my friend, I don't live here though, I have some sense of what happens here. As in America, the question that interests me is what is the relation between political intellectual life and ideological life? How much, how much of it has been ideologized, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, sometimes, sometimes ideologies seem to have more strength politically against non-ideological views, but that's shameful because one needn't have an ideology to have a powerfully held political belief to have a powerful held political belief? Well, of course, uh, ideologies have their usage. They can be uh, very fruitful and serve many purposes. But I would say on one condition, that uh, they are uh, properly challenged. That they are all the time uh, under uh, the pressure of intellectuals who examine and re-examine the basic tenets of ideology. And I think uh, in Israel uh, we live in a period in which the dominant ideology, which is Zionism, is being challenged more than, any, than in any other time in the past. And uh, the fact is, uh, to be, uh, I think, fair to the Israeli system, is that even those who challenge Zionism in the most telling way, the most devastating way, they do not suffer, suffer any sanction in this country. Uh, a person like uh, Yeshaul Lebovich, for example. Now a street is named after him in Jerusalem and the decision was taken by a municipality that consists of right-wing and uh, ultra-orthodox uh, elements. Uh, so a, a re-examination of dominant Israeli ideology is taking place all the time, I think it's even escalating, and I regard it as a very positive development. If I could just say one thing, I would say that Zionists make it too easy for their enemies to challenge them. In other words, most of the people that I know who call themselves Zionists, when I ask them what they mean, they cannot give me an adequate answer. They cannot, either in terms of Jewish history or Jewish philosophy or political philosophy, I cannot get a satisfactory answer. Um, and obviously, since Zionism does not mean the defense of whatever the Israeli government did yesterday, but has to mean something much broader, I have found that, that Zionism itself has, has, has intellectually crippled itself. It's not been crippled. Uh, many of its wounds have been self-inflicted, I guess is what I would say. Uh, if I'm allowed uh, a brief uh, response to, to your question, 
Of course, uh, if you look at individuals like Abishai Margalit or Ruth Gavison, there are fine examples of intellectuals who apply their intellects to, to current political issues. I think there's been a very interesting effort to import into Israel neoconservatism through the Shalem uh, Institute. And if, if you looked at what Yoram Chazoni wrote a few years ago, this, this was an effort to offer a right-wing alternative to individuals like uh, uh, Avishai, Avishai Margalit. Time will tell whether this effort to import neoconservatism to Israel has is, is been successful or, or not. I think we saw... Well, Itamar, can I just yeah, say one sure. thing, though? We have to be fair here. It cannot be that if you agree with me, you are an intellectual, but if you disagree with me, you're an ideologist. In other words, I think that, that we have to agree that in the, war, in the war of ideas, everybody has their ideas. Sometimes they come in packages, sometimes they don't come in packages, but uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the gentleman with the microphone, uh, there's a hand up there. Here, I have, okay. I have the microphone, I have, I have the power, I guess. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, actually, my question is, is on the power to distribute information, and it's primarily directed to P Professor Serre. Um, I heard you um, describe with, uh, I feel, some optimism uh, the, the uh, passionate times in which we live in and uh, passionating times in which we live in, and particularly this new model that we're going towards, uh, meaning a model from which the power to distribute information was um, described by a hierarchical, by a pyramid, uh, into a model in which uh, in, there are more emitters of information. And uh, in certain terms, this is very good, and I share your optimism. This is very good because it's more difficult to acquire, to buy exclusive control over a source of information, and uh, there is pl more pluralism and so on. But there are certainly problems, and I wanted to ask you how you deal with, with some problems. And uh, uh, personally, as, as a journalist, the, the first problem that comes to mind is um, the, um, the, the reduction or, uh, or even the absence of any form of, uh, of filtering and with, with filtering uh, of any form of, uh, how can I say, accountability and quality control, shall we say, on, on the source of the information. Whereas uh, at, we are in a situation in which uh, we have, um, you basically can find on these new media, on these new technologies, on the internet, you can find at the same point, at the same level, and you can have the same access to a plurality of good sources, of accountable sources of information, and at the same time to an equal amount uh, of conspiracy theorists, um, crazy nuts, uh, deniers of the Holocaust, and everyone is on the same level because everyone has the same access to the media to and can say whatever they want, and everyone has the same access, everyone is on the same level, and uh, how do you deal with this, and um, uh, is it, is it, do you think that it is necessary to have some form of gatekeeping, or do you think, do you trust the people, do you trust the public to be able to filter and to understand who is the accountable source and who is the crazy, conspir crazy conspiracy nut? Thank you. Je, je crois que toutes les réponses à votre question sont dans la question que vous posez. Parce que euh, je dois dire que, avec beaucoup de modestie, je ne peux pas répondre à cette question. J'ai dit tout à l'heure que nous n'avions pas encore d'idée sur le traitement de cette quantité d'informations dont vous parlez. Nous sommes exactement dans la même situation qu'au moment de l'invention de l'imprimerie. We are now in the same situation as in the era of the before the invention of printing. Lorsqu'on a inventé l'imprimerie, beaucoup de philosophes contemporains on dit qu'ils étaient déjà submergés sous le flot de l'information. Before already the printing, many uh, um, 
philosophers told that they were flooded with a lot of information. Et, et de fait, euh, vous n'avez pas lu complètement toute la bibliothèque de Washington ou de Paris ou de Tel Aviv. C'est impossible de l'avoir lu en entier et de pouvoir filtrer la qualité des informations sur la bibliothèque. We, we, uh, in a practical way, uh, we haven't read all the uh, libraries uh, and information for the United States, for France, for Israel. And of course, it's impossible to collect all this information as a whole. Donc la question s'est déjà posée dans les mêmes termes. So this question has already arisen in the same words and concept. Et aujourd'hui, en effet, nous n'avons pas réellement de réponse And today we don't really have à, an à deux ou trois questions que vous posez, to the two or three questions that la you quantité d'informations, la qualité des informations quality, et les erreurs. And all the errors. Et par conséquent, tout à l'heure, je disais au professeur Wieshalter que nous n'avions pas d'idées nouvelles pour traiter de cette question. Nous sommes donc en présence d'une nouveauté que nous ne comprenons pas complètement. We are dealing with an innovation that we still je don't suis, really understand. Je ne suis pas sûr d'être d'accord avec vous lorsque vous dites que ça n'a pas d'intérêt. Si, ça a beaucoup d'intérêt. I'm not oui. really sure to agree with you oui. when, you talk, when you say it's not very interesting. I think it has a certain interest. Seulement, l'intellectuel qui comprendra cette question n'est pas encore né. But the intellectual that will understand this question is not born yet. Et par exemple, au moment de l'invention de l'imprimerie, on a vu arriver euh, des philosophes comme Erasmus, comme Montaigne, etc., qui and, ont commencé à comprendre l'état de la question. And uh, with the invention of printing, we have seen philosophers such as uh, Erasmus et Montaigne that has just begun to understand the complexity of this issue. Et par exemple, Montaigne a eu une phrase très célèbre sur cette question. And Montaigne uh, has said a very important Thing about this issue. Il disait, je préfère une tête bien faite qu'une tête bien pleine. I prefer a head which is very, very well done than very, very filled. Comme si, comme si la manière de comprendre avait été changée par le support imprimé. As if the way to understand have been changed, modified by the uh, printing, printed support. Et je crois que nous assistons aujourd'hui à une transformation de ce genre. And we are witnessing today this kind of uh, transformation. Que, que peut-être une nouvelle manière de comprendre, une nouvelle manière de, de, de la cognition est en train de naître. As if a new um, mode of understanding is now taking place, is now born. Et la question politique est évidemment, est juste après cette question-là. And the political question just comes after Mais pour le moment, ce sont des questions ouvertes que je ne sais. Donc, en fait, je ne sais pas répondre à votre question. Meaning it's very open issues and truly I cannot answer your question. Could I just say one thing? I just make a small point actually as someone who I earn my living as a gatekeeper. Um, but uh, I think that one thing I'd like to say is that intellectuals in the highest sense, not in the anthropological or sociological sense, in the highest sense, what they do not deal with is information. I think one has to have a basic distinction between information and knowledge. Yes. A basic distinction. Yes. Um, there are many things that you can find on the internet that are information, but the question of whether God exists or who started the first world war or whether the nude descending a staircase is a beautiful picture or not, Those are not informational questions. The danger is that the new technology will reduce all knowledge to the status of information and will, will confuse people about the distinction between information and knowledge. And the distinction between information and knowledge can be expressed in many ways. One way to think about it is that the difference between information and knowledge is time, is time. Um, and by time, I mean also method. There was a, an early medieval Jewish philosopher who, in the, in, in the introduction to his work, asked a very, fun, very obvious question. He asked, if God wanted us to know the truth about everything, why didn't he just tell us? Right? 
And his answer was that if he had told us the truth about everything, then strictly speaking, we would not have known it. Meaning we would have possessed it as information, as information. And that distinction between knowledge and information, if one is speaking about intellectual life and in the age of the internet, I think is immensely important. Je, je suis d'accord sur le fait qu'il y a une différence fondamentale entre l'information et la connaissance. I, am, I agree with the fact that there has been a very deep uh, and true difference between knowledge and information. Mais, But, mais il se trouve que à une transformation sur la distribution de l'information correspond toujours une nouveauté de la connaissance. But uh, there is a kind, um, there is a between the, uh, tra the transformation of the distribution yeah. there is, and of the information correspond une nouveauté it comes de... with a new yeah. uh, a new knowledge with a new knowledge yes uh, par exemple lorsqu'on a inventé l'écriture for instance when we uh, invented the writing il y a une, nou une nouvelle connaissance qui est arrivée on a, a new invent... knowledge has on a inventé la géométrie Lorsqu'on a inventé l'imprimerie, la science expérimentale est arrivée. Experimental sciences came Par conséquent, chaque fois so, qu'il y a une transformation, every time there is a transformation dans la distribution de l'information, on assiste à, à une révolution concernant le knowledge, concernant we, la connaissance. We, we witness a revolution concerning knowledge. Donc on ne peut pas juger, on ne peut pas juger de la distinction entre l'information et la connaissance so in this distinction between information and knowledge we cannot judge sans avoir réellement jugé de la nouvelle connaissance qui est en train d'arriver without having judged the real new knowledge yeah, thank you yes please So, um, regarding this uh, last session, I would like to ask if you think intellectuals are actually the talent. It's uh, not a matter of uh, exercising and uh, is it the involvement of uh, natural curiosity, like a person has uh, ability to be a musician, a good musician, or is it we have to give our children and put many efforts in teaching them or either to be an intellectual is a natural talent? Um, well, I, as I said, at one level, we are all intellectuals. We all hold opinions, right? At that level, um, we're thinking creatures, or we're, the human beings are self-interpreting beings. Interpretation is, in some way, the essential human activity. And in that sense, we are all intellectuals. But in a stricter sense, I would like to think that, that an intellectual is defined by the by the philosophical and methodological seriousness with which he or she pursues an interest. In other words, it's, the, it's like the pursuit of any interest. Um, it is possible to pursue it in a dilettantish way, and it is possible to take one's interest very seriously. If one takes an intellectual interest very seriously, then I, I think this requires, as I said, time, meaning study. I think intellectuals should try not to speak about things that they know nothing about. I think that opinion is a degraded form of belief. Opinion may be the currency of democratic life, but you know, I think of a belief as an opinion with a, plus a reason, plus a reason. Many people have opinions but don't know the reasons for their opinions. But, but the minute you add a reason to an opinion, you have a belief, whether or not it's a justified belief. And that is the kind of work that an intellectual has to do, is provide justifications for beliefs. And those justifications can be empirical, uh, scientific, they can be logical or rational. Um, it would all depend. They cannot be, I should have to say, experiential. I am not interested in beliefs that are believed to be true because I experienced something that you did not. Or those formulations that we begin with now in the States or everywhere, as a white Jewish male, comma, I. I think that my inherited identity confers no intellectual authority upon me whatsoever. 
whatsoever. Um, and that one has to, and if one wishes to speak about, with authority about what one has inherited, one has to make it strange to oneself, one has to study it, and then one comes out on the other end where one can, one can speak with some authority. But, and that, by the way, is what bothers me about a good deal of intellectual life on what's called the blogosphere. Because, you know, the, 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 the premise, the assumption of bloggers is that a person's first thoughts are his best thoughts. Now, the minute you say that sentence, you know it's false, right? We all know that that's false. So I think that it, 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 it depends on the standards that one, that one holds for oneself. Uh, in a way, following the same line, uh, intellectuals, I believe, are defined in two different ways. Uh, they are defined sometimes by the cognitive process that they uh, engage in, uh, and then you have definitions like intellectuals are those who produce ideas, uh, and so on. And they are also defined, and this is now more controversial, um, in terms of their commitments. Uh, intellectuals are those who live uh, for ideas and not off ideas. This is the distinction between uh, the intellectuals and, and secondary intellectuals. I am reminded of a definition by the late Yaakov Talmon, who said that intellectuals are, are those who cannot sleep at night, and not because of what you think. Je croyais qu'en Israël, il y avait autant d'intellectuels que de personnes dans la population. I thought that in Israel there were as much as intellectual as people in the population. Thank you. Uh, um, I'd like to, to end by, by thanking our three panelists for taking us on a voyage from the power of ideas to the beauty of ideas. Thank you very much. <laughs>